So I'd like to thank you all very much for coming along tonight. This is Pilch's second Law and Social Change Dialogue. Who was here last year for the audit's participation? Ah, interesting. So we've got a, a different crowd. That's great. That's great. Uh, last year was a lot of fun. This year, I think, is also going to be very engaging. I think the level of interest, the event sold out a couple of weeks ago, so well done for getting uh, a ticket. Um, it, it really reflects the level of interest in the discussion about the role of law in bringing about social change. And of course, the extremely high caliber of our speaking panel, which I'll introduce to you shortly. But I think it also highlights the deep resonance of the public debate about Australia's response to asylum seekers. It's been a matter of controversy for many decades, in fact, in Australia, and David's going to uh, talk to us a little bit about that uh, in his remarks. I think it was brought into very sharp relief 10 years ago, 10 years ago tomorrow, in fact, when the MV Tampa rescued 433 asylum seekers in international waters near Australia. And the controversy continues on today. The Malaysian solution, mandatory detention of offshore asylum seekers, it's still a debate that causes a lot of passion. Throughout that time, lawyers have played an active role in challenging the decisions of government and holding them to account. But what I want us to think about tonight, and again what our speakers will reflect on, is what difference has this actually made? Lawyers have been active, there have been cases, and we'll talk about some of them tonight, but 10 years on from the Tampa, is change really possible in the area of the way we deal with asylum seekers? And what is the role for the law and lawyers in this? So before we, before we begin the formal part of our proceedings, I'd like to commence by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I also need to pass on an apology. His Honour Justice Chris Maxwell, the President of the Court of Appeal, was also uh, going to be one of our dialogue speakers tonight. But unfortunately, he is unwell and he was extremely disappointed to not be able to attend and pass on his best wishes for the event. We're very sad that he's not here because he played a really important part in the events around the Tampa 10 years ago and has continued to be an inspiration to so many of us uh, in his commitment to access to justice and human rights. So I'm sure you'll join with me in wishing him a speedy recovery. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Alan's Arthur Robinson, uh, a member of Pilch who have sponsored tonight's event. And I also want to acknowledge their recent work in acting on behalf of asylum seekers in two High Court proceedings. Uh, and Debbie Mortimer will no doubt touch on that when she speaks. Just to let you know how the evening will unfold, it's fairly simple format. Our three speakers will make short remarks on their uh, experiences in this area and give their reflections on this question of whether law can bring about change and reflect on their, their part in that. David will then uh, moderate our discussion and including fielding uh, your questions and uh, no doubt asking a few of his own. Uh, and we'll end the formal part of the evening at around eight o'clock and we hope you can join us for uh, a drink and to continue the conversations that you started uh, before I got up and hopefully other conversations that are prompted. So let me formally introduce our speakers, uh, set a little bit of context and then uh, you won't hear from me again for quite a while. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Julian Burnside QC AO. Uh, he is, uh, as many of you would know, all of you would no doubt know, um, one of Australia's foremost barristers, uh, human rights and refugee advocates and an author. He's known for his opposition to mandatory detention of asylum seekers and he's provided counsel in a wide array of high profile cases. He was admitted as a barrister in Victoria in 1976 and appointed Queen's Counsel in 1989. He's appeared in a number of notable cases apart from the Tampa litigation in 2001. This included acting for the Maritime Union of Australia in uh, its battle with Patrick Corporation during the 1998 uh, waterfront dispute. He's acted in a number of cases on behalf of Indigenous Australians, uh, most notably Bruce Trevorrow, a member of the Stolen Generations who successfully sued the South Australian government for damages for his removal, the first person who uh, was ever successful in such an action. 
Julian's also maintained his practice as a commercial litigator and continues to appear in class actions, trade practices cases and general commercial litigation. He was made an Officer of the Order of Australia in 2009 and the citation read in part, for service as a human rights advocate, particularly for refugees and asylum seekers, to the arts, as a patron and fundraiser and to the law. Our second uh, speaker is Debbie Mortimer SC, admitted to practice in 1998 and signing the role of the Victorian Bar the following year. She was appointed senior counsel in 2003. As a junior, she worked with uh, Eric Vidalis, Gavin Griffith QC and Jack Fagenborn QC in one of the two federal court cases that were brought following the Tampa uh, rescue. And since that time, she's appeared in many of the most significant federal and high court cases dealing with asylum seekers, including most recently last year, uh, the case that's known as M61, in which the high court held that asylum seekers have a right to judicial review of a refusal of an application for refugee status. And this week, she has appeared in the High Court in the challenge to the so-called Malaysian solution. And our final speaker and the moderator of our discussion is David Ma, journalist, author, and political and social commentator. His areas of expertise include the law, Australian politics, censorship, the media, and the arts, as well as uh, issues around asylum seekers and refugees. He writes for the Sydney Morning Herald, appears as a panelist on Q&A and Insiders. He uh, is actually a lawyer uh, originally and worked as an article clerk at Allen, Allen and Hemsley in Sydney before turning to journalism. He worked for the Bulletin, the National Times and Four Corners and during his time there he won a Walkley Award. He's also hosted uh, Media Watch. He's written several books including a critically acclaimed biography of Australian writer Patrick White. Uh, and more, more recently and perhaps more relevantly for this evening he wrote um, the definitive account of the event surrounding the Tampa, which is called Dark Victory. Uh, and we've got copies of that book for sale here tonight. Um, and if you ask David very nicely, he may even sign it for you. Please make them welcome. So before we um, commence, I'd like to set a little bit of context uh, for the evening. Some of you may not remember the events surrounding the Tampa as I look out. Some of you would have been uh, youngish, shall we say, 10 years ago. Perhaps for others it may feel like only yesterday and I know from the conversations I've had with many people that were involved in the Tampa when I rang them and said, did you know it's 10 years? They said, really? No, it can't possibly be 10 years. It feels like yesterday. So I thought uh, I would set some context and I can do no better than to start by reading um, a few, par few paragraphs from uh, the book Dark Victory. August 23, 2001. When the red dot first appeared on the horizon, no one stirred. They'd been disappointed too often in the days since their engine failed to be roused by the sight of a ship in the distance. One boat had already sailed by, ignoring them. Australian planes had circled overhead, but then left them to wallow in the sea. The shape they saw on the horizon was so small that some of them on the Palapa one thought it might be another boat like theirs, crammed full of people making for Christmas Island. But when that small red dot turned into a cargo ship, people climbed on the roof to wave and shout. Kododad Sarawi said, there was nothing left for us in this world if the ship goes past. Sawari, a teacher, sat jammed between his wife and their three children and his brother on the boat's flimsy upper deck. The family was fleeing the Taliban. So were most of the people on the Palapa. By now they were exhausted, ill and thirsty. Most had spent the last few days vomiting. They'd faced death the previous night in a violent storm which they believed they had survived only by a miracle. Now a cargo boat was bearing down on them. We were telling the children there is hope because we didn't want them to give up, to collapse. We were praying God would save us. Then when it was getting closer to us, we saw it was huge and there was a big sign on it written, Tampa. The great hull slid past. All of a sudden, people were screaming that they're not going to rescue us, said Sarawi. We were extremely hopeless. These were the worst moments of their whole ordeal on the ocean. Now we were not thinking about this world, but preparing ourselves for the other world. The most terrifying thing for us was to see our children, at their age, dying. 
But after 10 minutes, the boys were saying, it's getting closer. And again, there was hope. The cargo boat had stopped and was edging back towards them, sheltering the palapa in the lee of its enormous hull. When a long metal stair was lowered, the people on the palapa finally knew they were saved. So as you may recall, despite the, uh, the rescue at sea, the Australian government refused the pleas of the rescued people and the reasonable expectation of the ship's captain, Arnie Rinnan, to land on Christmas Island. Instead, Captain Rinnan was told to keep the Tampa outside of Australia's territorial waters. Faced with suicide threats and deteriorating health conditions on board the ship, the captain made the decision to head the boat towards Australia anyway. In response, the Australian government sent 45 SAS soldiers to take command of the Norwegian vessel. Back in Melbourne, lawyers at Pilch were monitoring the events with interest and growing alarm. Co-executive director Emma Hunt recalls, we were deeply concerned about the way these people were being treated and we were wondering, what can we do to help? Out of the blue, we were contacted by Melbourne barrister John Manetta, who asked if we were planning to do anything and whether he could help. Together, Pilch and John Mineta put together a legal team, including Jul Julian Burnside QC and law firm Holding Redlick. Repeated attempts to obtain instructions from asylum seekers on the ship to act for them were unsuccessful. Instead, Pilch partnered with Liberty Victoria, then under the leadership of Chris Maxwell QC, who agreed to act as the client in a federal court application. Two arguments were made. The first was that the Australian government had acted unlawfully in refusing the rescued asylum seekers the right to apply for refugee status. They also sought a writ of habeas corpus, arguing that the asylum seekers were being unlawfully detained on the ship. Pilch was joined at the court by Melbourne solicitor Eric Vidalis and his team, including Debbie Mortimer and Erskine Roden, who were making similar arguments. The two teams joined forces and the case was initially heard before Justice North, who ruled that the parties did not have standing to make the first argument, that the government had acted unlawfully, but that the rescued people had been illegally detained, and he ordered their release from the boat to the mainland of Australia. Unfortunately, the jubilation following this decision was short-lived. The Commonwealth immediately repealed, uh, appealed and the full bench of the federal court held two to one that the detention of the asylum seekers was not illegal and that the Commonwealth had executive power to act as it had done. Eric Vidalis' application for leave to appeal to the High Court some weeks later was rejected. The lawyers had held the government to account, but ultimately had been unsuccessful in changing the situation of the asylum seekers. They were never allowed to land in Australia they were processed on Manus Island and on Nauru. Almost 200 of them were returned to Afghanistan, Pakistan and Sri Lanka. 208 were accepted as asylum seekers by New Zealand, 10 by Canada and Scandinavia and just 28 by Australia. 10 years on, it's timely to reflect what has changed. And many of the lawyers who worked on those federal court cases are with us tonight as our special guests. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, Emma Hunt and Samantha Birchall, co-executive directors of Pilch at the time, and Phil Lynch, who was on secondment uh, from Alan Zarth Robinson at Pilch. Uh, John Manetta, Debbie Mortimer, SC Julian Burnside QC, and Greg Connellan, uh, all at that time of Victorian Bar are with us. And solicitors David Shaw and Andrew Giles uh, from Holding Redlick, and Eric Vidalis and Erskine Roden. There are a number that couldn't join us, but who sent their best wishes, including Justice Tony North, Justice Chris Maxwell, as I've mentioned, Gavin Griffith QC, Danielle Brennan, and Captain Arnie Rinnan himself of the MV Tampa, who was on holidays uh, at the time, uh, but sent his best wishes and said I was really just doing what I had to do to rescue people and help them. So that's enough from me. Uh, I'd like to hand over now to our first speaker, Julian Burnside. Thanks very much. Um, I would like to start by paying tribute especially to John Mineta, uh, who 
I think, devised the idea and um, who, with the blandishments of lunch at a Japanese shop nearby, um, suggested that I would do the case. And so I said yes. Uh, but also Chris Maxwell, whose role was invaluable, and Eric, uh, who joined forces with us and was um, a constant encouragement, and many other people, of course, but those three in particular um, I wanted to mention. One thing is not known and hasn't been mentioned so far, and that is that Justice North's decision, um, favourable to the applicants, has not been widely noticed, perhaps because it was handed down at 2.15pm Melbourne time on September 11th, 2001. And if you didn't read about it in the next morning's paper, you'll understand why. Um, my involvement in the case was largely accidental, um, accidental in the sense that John asked me, and I suppose I was the first one on his list who said yes, uh, accidental also because I came to it with no knowledge of refugee law, or more importantly, refugee policy in Australia in the way it was conducted. Um, luckily, because of Eric's team, um, I was able to learn a great deal about these things from Debbie Mortimer, who still knows far more about the subject than I ever will know. I also learned a couple of things during the case um, that I think I would rather have not learned. Uh, in particular, I learned a few things about Australian politics and the Australian community. Um, although I've been involved from time to time in some fairly controversial cases, and perhaps the most controversial is the uh, waterfront dispute in 1998, um, the Tampa was the first case uh, in which I have received death threats. And it did come as something of a surprise to get back to chambers and find death threats um, that had been sent. Uh, and disappointing, too, because realistically anyone uh, with eyes to see would recognise that the people on the Tampa were absolutely incapable of doing anything to help themselves. and lawyers uh, willing to go and help them pro bono, I should have thought, might deserve general public condemnation and contempt, perhaps, but, <laughs> but death threats, I thought, maybe a step too far. Um, the politics of the occasion uh, are well burnt onto our memories, and it's interesting to compare the politics then and the politics now, which I think have not changed very much at all. Um, then, John Howard, um, condemned boat people as illegals and uh, declared that we would decide who comes to this country and the circumstances in which they come. Um, uh, now, of course, Tony Abbott shrugs off whatever de Christian decency he once had as he is studying for the priesthood and demands ever harsher measures uh, against uh, boat people so as to make sure that none of them ever manage to get here. Um, Curiously, he dresses that up as a concern about people smugglers, uh, but never quite gets to the dog whistle message that as long as the people smugglers business model is smashed, boat people won't be able to get here unless they're strong swimmers. Um, his every moment on this issue is marked by his Olympian hypocrisy. Um, uh, now, of course, we have Julia Gillard, who has managed to overlook entirely the advances which Chris Evans made in 2008 in connection with the treatment of refugees and has in substance adopted uh, most of the philosophies of the Howard and Ruddock policies in relation to asylum seekers and it's a matter of profound regret to think that after 10 years with what we learnt at the time of Tampa with all the misery that we inflicted on people doing nothing worse than seeking our help in those 10 years, the politicians still see nothing better than the possibility of garnering a few votes in some corners of the community where mistreating innocent people is regarded as a decent sport. It's interesting to learn that, um, uh, as everyone, I think, recognised, that at the time of Tampa, uh, there had been a significant drift of support from the Liberal Party to One Nation. Uh, in particular, those of fairly hard-right anti-migration views were joining One Nation and abandoning the Liberals. Jackie Kelly, um, who later disgraced herself vicariously through her husband, um, Jackie Kelly was feeling the pinch in her electorate and she barged up to Howard uh, um, as he was going into Parliament ready to deliver a speech about how he was going to handle the Tampa episode. She complained to him 
that One Nation were drawing away uh, the anti-immigrant groups in her electorate. Howard waved his speech notes at her and said, don't worry, this will fix all of that. There is no doubt whatever that Howard's attitude to Tampa, his response to Tampa, was driven solely by a desire to garner votes. And it is a lamentable fact that we live in a country where politicians are prepared to ignore even the most basic decencies in order to hang on to power or to get hold of it. Um, back then, of course, they cobbled together the Pacific solution. I think it was on the second or third, third day of the case, perhaps, that uh, the Solicitor General announced in court that an arrangement had been reached with Nauru uh, to take the people rescued by Tampa. Today, of course, we have the Malaysian solution, which in substance is the same. Uh, the minor difference is that Malaysia is a big country and can't be pushed around in the same way that Nauru was. Poor little Nauru, bankrupt, with a population of about eight or 9,000 people, was colonised for the time being by Australia so that all of the organs of government were in effect run by the Australian government, so much so that you couldn't even get to Nauru unless you were working for the Australian government or unless you're enterprising enough like my wife Kate to go with a BBC journalist uh, and come in the back door via Kiribati and Fiji um, and then to walk in and get a two-day transit visa pending the arrival of the next plane out. Um, interestingly, the, the Australian government um, took a very dim view of the fact that, uh, that um, Kate and the BBC journalist got to Nauru, and they even put on their website uh, a complaint that these two had entered Nauru illegally, for which you have to understand entered Nauru without the permission of Australia, albeit with a Nauruan visa. You have to think it through to understand exactly how grim that is. Um, later, actually this is off the point, but later, and since Chris Maxwell isn't here, um, I'm allowed to have an extra one minute. Um, later, um, we, a group of us set up a habeas corpus action in the Nauruan Supreme Court. The purpose of the action was to test the legality in Nauruan law of the fact that people were being detained in the topside camp uh, in, in um, Nauru. Now, um, the Nauruan Migration Act doesn't say anything about refugees and it doesn't say anything about detention. So it was something of a novelty that these people were being banged up against their will, especially in circumstances where Nauru had agreed to allow them to arrive and stay in Nauru. That was the whole point of the Pacific Solution. Um, we managed to get a hearing date for the habeas corpus application. Um, we applied to have it heard by the Chief Justice of Nauru, who lives in Melbourne and who has his office in Melbourne. We asked him if he might hear the case in Melbourne, since the lawyers on both sides all came from Melbourne. It seemed reasonable, but he refused. And so we all go out to the airport on the um, Sunday night. Um, it had taken me a good deal of trouble to get a Nauruan visa, but that's another story. Um, we all went out there on the Sunday night to get on the plane to get ready for court on Monday morning. And um, the, the team for the Nauruan government got on the plane, that was fine, but then I was refused permission to board by the people at the gate lounge because they'd had orders from the president of Nauru not to let me on the plane. Uh, we were dealing with quite strange times. Now, I don't think Malaysia is going to be pushed around quite like that. On the other hand, that has some difficulties because the Malaysian solution is uh, found in a document which is non-binding, non-enforceable, and it might be a little more comforting um, if the promises of decent treatment had been given by a government that didn't have such a disgraceful record in relation to human rights. And frankly, I find it very difficult to believe how anyone in the Australian government can imagine that the people who we traffic to Malaysia, if they get there, uh, will be treated in the way that Australia faintly imagines that they will. There is an interesting thing about the Malaysian solution, though. Here's something to reflect on. We apparently negotiated a deal that the people we send back to Malaysia can only be detained for 45 days and then they should be released into the community with work rights. Well, now there's an idea. We could do that here. And if we did that here, we wouldn't have the problem for which the Malaysian solution is a solution, apparently. The overcrowding would diminish immediately. Uh, the health consequences of re detaining people indefinitely would go away immediately. The fantastic cost of locking up innocent people for years on end would drop spectacularly. 
I think it's a win-win situation. I just wonder if they have noticed that they might do that. For all this, for all the fact that the politics now are just as grim and wretched as they were uh, 10 years ago, I think there is room for hope. And the hope comes from this. I think that many Australians have actually developed in ways that our political leaders have not. I think a lot of members of the community now understand that treating people in the way we do is probably not such a good idea and probably not justifiable. I think that there are people in the community who recognise that the Tampa episode did great damage to Australia's national image and who also recognise, albeit reluctantly, that if we persist with behaviour like this, we may just damage our national soul. We may become what we do. We may become a nation of people who are willing to damage innocent uh, uh, victims of persecution, people who are, as a nation, who are willing to harm deliberately people who've done nothing worse than come here quietly asking for our help. Um, the role of lawyers in the case was, I think, um, terrific. And one interesting consequence of it is that um, from time to time since Tampa, I've had emails from people I've never met saying that they used to think lawyers were horrible and they now think lawyers are not bad. <laughs> I don't want to overstate it. But the Tampa was a perfect illustration of a case where the people affected were helpless in the extreme, were weak and desperate, and they were confronting a government as powerful and determined as ever it's possible to confront. And I, I, I have to say, I look back with some pride on the fact that so many lawyers were willing to give their time and expertise to doing whatever they could to help the people who'd been rescued by the Tampa. Arne Rinnan says that he was just doing what he had to do, and I think every lawyer on our side of the case was just doing what they had to do. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm very pleased to see Eric Vidalis sitting there in the front row, my colleague, with um, uh, the courage to stand up and bring that proceeding 10 years ago, sufficiently belligerent to see it through until the High Court stopped him. And uh, you should give him a round of applause for that. And I'm also very pleased to see Erskine Roden sitting next to him because if Julian Burnside says that he thinks I know more about migration law than he does, then Erskine Roden knows quantitatively more about migration law than I do. And um, he's been uh, working in this area and acting for people uh, like the people that we acted for in the Tampa um, for a lot longer than I think anyone else um, in this country has been. Uh, I thought, I've been asked to talk about what's changed over the last 10 years in the legal environment and uh, I thought what I'd do is, is uh, talk about what's changed and also about what's not changed and there are fairly evenly balanced categories I think. But can I start by picking up on something that Julian really finished with um, and which distresses me a little bit about the way, uh, particularly if you look over the last few weeks, cases about uh, people like those I've been acting for over the last few weeks and like those we all acted for in the Tampa are being reported because they're being reported as if they're lawyers' cases. And that's just not right. And I really think the media has something to answer for about that because it's coming across to the Australian public as if uh, lawyers are bringing these cases with our clients. Now, of course, in the Tampa we had, we had a logistical difficulty that I'll talk a little bit more about. But it's not one, for example, that we've had in the last couple of cases in the High Court that I've been involved in. And it's most important to remember that, um, really is, I think the thing that Julian was emphasising, that we're here as vehicles to do a job to ensure that people who are present in our community and in our territory have the same access to the law that everybody else has. And that's all we've asked. That's all we asked in the Tampa, 
that the same principles that apply to every single person sitting in this room be applied to those people. And that's all we asked in the High Court last week. Um, and it's those people who are bringing this litigation. It's not lawyers bringing this litigation, it's those people. And there are now plenty of lawyers who are prepared to stand up and assist them. But I really would like to see the media report it in a little bit more of the way that I think it should be like that. Now, what's changed, um, if I start with the positive? What's changed is that um, I see more barristers prepared to do this kind of work. I see an incredible crop of talented young barristers coming through and proportionately much greater numbers who are interested and committed to do this work and who give up a great deal of their practices and therefore a great deal of financial reward to be able to do this work. Um, the same can be said of law firms. There's an, a, a greatly increased commitment of law firms and I do want to single Alan's Arthur Robinson out for some special praise here because uh, over the last few years, not just in the two high court cases that I've been involved in, but in many, many others, they have really stepped up and showed a lot of leadership nationally about how a well-resourced uh, commercial firm can, uh, can make change in this area. They can inspire their own lawyers to stay with them and continue to work in this area, and they provide people like me and the barristers that work with me with equivalent resources to those that we're fighting against. And it's very hard to win these kinds of cases uh, when you're resource poor, it's not impossible, but uh, when the resource allocation becomes a bit more equal, then, then the fight becomes a bit more equal too. So that's a, that's a great development and it's one that I hope will continue. I think the other thing that I'd like to point out that's changed is that uh, through a long series of cases, particularly in the High Court, but not just in the High Court, um, there's been a really firm and robust attitude to the rule of law developed in this area. And uh, a couple of cases notably aside, like the case of El Kateb, um, which was a, a tragic result about the capacity of the Commonwealth to keep a person indefinitely in detention, but narrowly lost 4-3, but you know that one vote was all that was needed to make some tragic law. But those cases aside, what you've seen over the last 10 years um, in the development of the law in this area, as the courts apply it, it, is a firm commitment to the rule of law, without fear or favour. And I think one thing that we should never forget in this country and be internally grateful for is that we have a very courageous judiciary who take their independence very seriously. And again, um, Reporting that suggests otherwise is misleading. And uh, increasingly, the High Court issue, migration law has led the way in rule of law issues in the High Court, and I expect that to continue. Um, and that's a terrific thing to be able to be part of and to observe. Now, <coughs> what has not changed? What has not changed is that the people that we act for continue to be locked up in remote locations essentially kept incommunicado so that lawyers can't get at them. And uh, that was spectacularly demonstrated in the last two weeks. So despite what the courts might say about people's access to the law, um, their practical access to the law has not improved. Other problems about trying to run litigation for clients held in remote locations have not improved. The um, process of trying to get people to Christmas Island to take statements from clients is extraordinarily difficult. And so if one wonders about why there isn't more litigation on behalf of these people, um, anybody that's been involved in the logistical difficulties that are involved would know why. And, and of course it's mandatory detention singly probably that is responsible uh, for that situ situation. What else has not changed is the politically charged nature of the topic that we, that we deal with. Uh, in my view overcharged and still apparently no decent political leadership uh, on the horizon about a change to that. And what that leads to is an ongoing and um, uh, unnecessary legislative reaction 
uh, every time that there's a win in the courts, every time that it looks like asylum seekers might get um, something approaching decent treatment. Uh, the Migration Act is amended yet again to try and shut down access to the courts, to try and shut down the achievements that have been realised. And that again seems to me to be simply flowing from a lack of political leadership. And it's sad to think that we haven't um, changed very much in relation to that in the last 10 years. So on balance, uh, in my view, legally, uh, things are in a much better and stronger position than they were 10 years ago. Ironically, the effect of the Tampa case, that is what the Tampa case says about executive power, is a matter that remains unresolved so far as the law is concerned. Uh, and last week, or this week, when was it? This week in the High Court, um, the Solicitor General, um, in putting his argument on behalf of the Commonwealth in the Malaysian Solution case, described the tamper and its aftermath as the mischief that the legislation that the court's now considering was designed to deal with. And the um, Pacific Solution was positively advanced by the Commonwealth as explaining why what they are now proposing to do in Malaysia was perfectly lawful. Now, that's a shame. Uh, finally, um, whether things have changed in the broader community, uh, you know, really I remain undecided about that. Um, the real tragedy though, as far as I'm concerned, is that the people that I've been representing this week are in no different situation from the people that we were all representing 10 years ago. They're the same good people seeking nothing more than safety and security and people who would be grateful for generosity being shown by this country towards them, and they are still waiting to see that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be following Debbie at this microphone. I've been watching her from the public gallery of the High Court for a couple of days, watching one of the most remarkable tussles that I've ever seen in a court between a woman who seems to know every single subsection of every remote addition to one of the largest acts in the Australian statute books, and to stand there unmoved and just bat it out with those judges. And it isn't a matter of eloquence. It's a matter of the most astonishing technical mastery, which is, of course, the thing our High Court, alas, admires most in the world. It was quite a performance. Can't wait for next Wednesday. I'm only the co-author of the Dark Victory book, and my co-author, Marion Wilkinson, joins me in greeting you tonight, and also, once again, congratulating the legal teams who tried and failed to get the people off the tamper. To Eric Pedalis, who I have to say no longer looks like his photograph, but then none of us do. To the team from Pilch, who were also, and all of them, who were so wonderfully helpful to Marion and me when we were putting that book together. I think we owe ourselves a duty not to get wrong what Australia thinks about boat people. And I wish I could share Julian's optimism about a change of heart in this country, but it is not there. In the last few months, a series of polls have been taken to see what Australia's fundamental attitudes are to asylum seekers who come to this country by boat. Let me give you just a selection of a few of the findings of those polls. This is the Lowy poll from earlier this year. Despite everything people like you and me have been arguing for 10 years or more, 63% of Australians believe that boat people are queue jumpers. 62% of them 
This is of the whole of Australia. These are very good polls. 62% of them believe that boat people are potential security risks. 60% of Australians, and now I move to an Ipsos poll of a few months ago, 60% of Australians worry that the boat people will bring with them terrorism. Only 40% of Australians, and now I go to an amnesty poll, believe that people coming to this country by boat are genuine refugees. And only, and only 47% of Australians believe that we have any treaty obligation whatever to house refugees in this country if they arrive here by boat. And yet, last week in the age, you will have seen a wonderful figure from a Nielsen poll, a Nielsen poll that I helped design, which shows that 53% of Australians believe that once boat people have got here, we should deal with them decently. It's a very reassuring figure. We don't like these people. We don't want them to come. We think they bring with them the possibilities of violence and terrorism. There are even some very uncomfortable figures about them bringing disease. But nevertheless, there is a principled belief in at least 53% of us that once they have got here, we deal with them decently. We assess their claims for refugee protection. And that is about the only reassurance I can draw from polling figures at the moment about the attitudes to boat people. There has always been, of course, a constituency for doing the right thing to boat people. It's there from the very, very beginning. What might be a robust constituency if politicians cared to turn to it and to develop it and to lead it. The first boat, as you probably know, arrived in Darwin Harbour in April 1976. It had sailed with the, help of a, with the help of a little compass and a page ripped from a school atlas from Saigon to Malaysia, from Malaysia to Darwin. There were five men on board. They had a great deal of difficulty finding anybody to turn themselves into. They eventually did the following morning and they were the first boat and it caused, an, it caused in this country a psychic shock. The moat no longer protected us from yellow people in the north. There were very few boats in that first boat wave and very, very few people. There were about 2,000 people arrived by boat and although Malcolm Fraser can rightly be praised, for settling in this country nearly 100,000 Vietnamese refugees. He and his government did everything, and that everything included sending parties of people to sabotage and knock out the hulls of boats. They did everything to make sure boats did not reach Australia. It's always, always, always the boats. That's the focus of the terror in this country. It's the boats. Um, in 1979, the first poll on, on the boats was taken, a Morgan poll, and 32% of those polled, and it was a good poll, said that these boat people should never be allowed into, into Australia and they should all be made to go away. But 60% said at least some of them should be allowed to stay. That's the start of the decent constituency. But of course, the politicians decided that is a, as, an, as a strange, exercise in bipartisanship that they would play to the fearful constituency and not to the decent constituency in this country. We associate bipartisanship with great reform achievements, with things like opening up the Australian economy to the world or, and crucially, dismantling the white Australia policy, bipartisan arrangements. Uh, things that could not happen in this country unless the major parties declared a truce. Well, they did declare a kind of, they did declare a truce on boat people as well, but they decided together to kick the shit out of them. And they have done so from 1976 ever since. Mandatory detention was introduced to this country in 1992 
as a bipartisan arrangement after a total of 2,400 boat people had reached Australia between 1976 and 1992. 2,400. By the end of the second wave of, of boat arrivals in 1993, there was another poll, this time a Solwick poll, and that showed that the proportion of Australians who wanted all boat people sent away was 46%. It had risen. It had risen quite dramatically. But still, but still the constituency that wanted boat people allowed into the country and processed here was bigger. It was 48%. There was always the other constituency, the constituency that politicians decided not to play to. Now, let's not fool ourselves that this is not about race. I love it. I'm going to collect at some stage in my life all of the statements from people like Ruddock and Howard and Alexander Downer and Janet Albrechtson saying, this is not about race. And indeed, to, and indeed to, to argue that it is about race, and I suppose I'm edging over into the Janet Albrechtson area now, to argue that it is about race is actually a thuggish attempt on behalf of people like me to silence debate itself. It's an act, she says, of censorship to declare that race is at stake here. Just as we should look at the figures, they should too. And there is no doubt from polling over a very long time that the people who are most worried about the boats are those who are also most worried about any immigration to this country from anywhere but Europe. They are also revealed to me by that wonderful statistician and political scientist Murray Goot recently. They are also people who are highly likely to object to what they consider are privileges extended to Aborigines. And they are also highly likely to want capital punishment returned. Now, that's the core of the fearful constituency in this country that John Howard used during the Tampa. The brilliance with which he beat up a panic in that time is, is as a professional exercise, probably unmatchable in the history of this country. What he did, of course, was to ally race fear with patriotism and bring the two together into this explosive combination where suddenly our borders were at risk. And, and he was the one who brought into this area an expression that had hitherto only been used in rather highfalutin arguments about tariff control, and that's border protection. Border protection is John Howard's invention. Border protection, which we still use, brings into this the indescribably pompous notion that these boat people are actually invaders. Just after the Tampa, finally sailed, Morgan again did a poll. He did a poll here, New Zealand, America and the United Kingdom and a very, very simple question about boat people. Would you let them in and process them or would you send them back to sea? Back to sea. The toughest way of putting the question, would you send them back to sea? The United States, 25% for sending them away. New Zealand has never had a boat yet. Oh, except for some long canoes once. 44% for sending boat people away. The United Kingdom, 43%. Australia was 68%. Off the dial. Now, it's reassuring to me that a couple of years later, when much the same question was asked by another pollster, the 68, 70, 74% approval ratings for what Howard did during the Tampa had, a couple of years later, Australia looked at what happened at the Tampa, a bit down the track, and had second thoughts about what happened there. Tony Abbott, no, no, no. Let's, be, let's give honour where honour is due. The bipartisan arrangement between the parties survived Tampa. It was hugely damaging to Labor, but it survived Tampa. It actually even survived the Kevin Rudd reforms. Um, the coalition ticked off on all of the reforms in 2008. But at the end of 2008, as the boats began to come back, um, uh, Malcolm Turnbull began to take advantage of it. And for the first time in the history of this country, 
the opposition began a campaign from opposition to damage the government over the failure to be cruel enough to the boats. And that intensified under Tony Abbott, as you know, and that continues now. The statisticians, uh, the, the pollsters over the last few months all agree that the attitude of Australia, I'm afraid to say, Julian, is becoming gloomier about the boats. They're becoming more pessimistic about the possibilities of controlling those boats. Eight polls over the last seven or eight months have asked the question, is Australian policy towards the boats too soft or too harsh? Now, the figures are actually all over the shop, but it's very, very clear where things stand. I've done a mathematically completely unforgivable thing, and I've averaged them. Those who think that the current policies about boat people are, rather, are, are either okay or too soft, 75%. Those who think the current policies of the Australian government towards boat people are too harsh, 10%. I think you're all part of the 10%. We cannot fool ourselves that there is a strong democratic reassessment of what has been done and is being done to the boats. It is not there. Change. There's something up there, oh, it was originally, saying possibilities of change. Both parties in this country are, <laughs> are gutless on race. Thank God. Both parties in this country are gutless on race. But since John Howard, during the Tampa and now under Tony Abbott, we have seen a remarkable thing in this country, which is the politics of race, campaigning on race, turning to the, race, to the racially fearful as a source of political strength is being carried out as a strategy by a mainstream party. In Europe, this is done by nutter parties. In the United States, it's done by nutter parties. In this country, it is being done by a mainstream party where, in fact, inside of which and whose supporters, where the forces of decency far outweigh the forces of extreme conservatism who like this kind of thing. I've said this before and I say it again. Change, the possibility of real change, the possibility of solving this problem has to start inside the Liberal Party. And it has to start by the overwhelmingly decent people who back that party and who are members of that party standing up for themselves and their values inside that party and compelling change. Unless, because I have so little faith in the Labour Party being able to get itself together in this field, my confidence is, my belief is, that we are only going to solve this mess, this embarrassing mess, if the Liberal Party cleans up its act. Thanks.